Hi everybody, Mr. Forshe here, and today I want to tell you a little bit about Frederick Douglass and his book, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. And in order to do that, I want to tell you a little bit about the slave narrative genre that Douglass's book um, represents so well. In my opinion, it is the best of the slave narratives. And I want to tell you a little bit, a little bit about who Frederick Douglass was. He was one of the foremost public intellectuals of the 19th century in America and a leading abolitionist writer, publisher, and speaker. And so I, I want to define those terms for you too. Before I get into it, I want to position Frederick Douglass in the, in the arc of American literature and more specifically black American literature. Remember we talked already about uh, Jupiter Hammond, the first African American poet who uh, published his first poem in 1761 and about Phyllis Wheatley, who published her um, poems on various subjects, religious and moral, in 1773. And notice the date of Frederick Douglass's publication. It's 1845. That's already a date that I've asked you to learn, because what great American poet published his great famous poem in 1845? Hopefully you got it. It is Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven was published in 1845. So in the same year that Poe was publishing The Raven, Frederick Douglass has published his, his narrative, his autobiographical account. Now, I've talked some to you already about the kind of trajectory of American literature, and I've made this case to you, that poetry is a human fundamental and essential. We human beings will always need to put words, well-chosen words, in the best order that we can to most beautifully or most appropriately express our human experience. We just need that as human beings. We can't get away from it. But literature as a fine art, literature as um, uh, storytelling that um, uses uh, words as its medium to um, to craft novels and short stories, that in a sense is the luxury of a people who have a certain amount of stability, liberty, and their basic needs provided for. And that, I hope you remember, that's why I argued that in the first couple hundred years of uh, European existence in this continent of North America, the predominant genres of writing were poetry, because we always need that, and nonfiction, because you had a people busy with the work of staying alive and securing liberty and stability for themselves. And in the Black American experience, you have the same thing. You have poets early in American literature, like Jupiter Hammond and Phyllis Wheatley, um, and you have the primary genre of black American writing in the 19th century, the slave narratives, nonfiction accounts of a formerly enslaved person's life under slavery and his escape from it. And I hope you can see that we have a very similar trajectory here, that for black Americans, they are busy with the work of staying alive and securing a certain amount of liberty and stability for themselves. And the slave narratives are that nonfiction genre absolutely essential to doing that. And once they have secured a certain amount of that stability and security, well then we get the creative explosion of the Harlem Renaissance coming in the 1920s when you have black musicians, poets, novelists, uh, short story writers, um, did I already mention musicians? If not, I certainly should. Jazz music is, of course, the great cultural product of the Harlem Renaissance. But you have this enormous explosion, explosion of creativity in the 1920s in uh, black American literature in much the same way that we had this enormous explosion of creativity in white American literature between the years of about 1820 and 1860. In fact, you'll remember that we talked about how Poe's Raven is published in 1845, and uh, The Scarlet Letter then is published in 1850, and Moby Dick is published in 1851. Around the same time, Longfellow's publishing. It's just this enormous explosion of creativity. 
And we're going to see the same arc with black American literature. And right now we're right in that place where black Americans are telling their stories. They're using the power of the pen to secure for themselves those blessings of liberty and stability that are going to become essential to creating literature as a fine art. All right, so um, the slave narrative I've just defined for you here. I've given uh, its definition, its importance. Uh, it is the major genre of African-American literature in the 19th century and an enormous influence on subsequent American literature by both black and white authors. Its influence includes um, influencing Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which we will later read, and in contemporary literature, Toni Morrison's Beloved. Some noteworthy examples of the slave narrative. At the beginning of the course, we read a small excerpt from one from Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, which was published in 1861. One of the earlier ones that I have mentioned before, but we've not read, is uh, Gustavus Vasa's interesting narrative of the life of Alaudo Equiano, or Gustavus Vasa, the African, published in 1789. And the one you see on the screen here is Solomon Northup's Twelve Years a Slave, published in 1853, and there's a fantastic uh, movie version done of that book a couple years ago. Sadly, there has not been a movie version done of uh, Frederick's narrative, which I think is a real shame because it, it would make it a fantastic movie, and it is a hugely important book, and uh, Douglas himself is a hero of a man, and I wish more people knew about it. All right, so in order to set the context for all this, I want to talk to you a little bit about slavery and abolitionism in the 19th century. Abolition just means the desire to get rid of something. To abolish means to get rid of. But in our context, in the 19th century in America, um, abolitionism, more precisely, should be defined as the 18th and 19th century position that slavery should be immediately, totally, and unconditionally ended in the United States. And a person who believed that and agitated for those changes was known as an abolitionist. Now notice in the definition I say immediately, totally, and unconditionally. I'm following historians in defining it that way because there were many people in the 19th century in America, uh, for example, Abraham Lincoln, who were on board with the gradual um, dying out of slavery, uh, but he was not considered an abolitionist because he did not want the immediate, total, and unconditional end to slavery. And there are there many others of, of a similar view. So the abolitionist is someone who doesn't want to just wait for uh, 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 years or however long it might take for the institution to supposedly die out on its own. Now, we've talked before about slavery, of course, and here again are the misconceptions about slavery that I have uh, addressed, and then my argument against each one of those. And I'm not going to go through each one of them again uh, right now, but I do want to add one more to them here at the bottom that's important for Douglas's context. And th this misconception is that the Civil War was about states' rights or sectional differences and not about slavery. And against that misconception, I want to argue quite forcefully that the central cause of the Civil War was, in fact, slavery. Now, I say the central cause because slavery was a complex and huge political issue of 19th century American life. And so that complexity expressed itself in all sorts of various ways. Um, and I don't want to oversimplify all of the conflict that happened in the 19th century um, that divided the country into sections and then a kind of tribalism or more properly sectionalism, this emotion that wants to defend one's own region or section no matter what the other side does. All of those are important factors to look into as well. There are economic differences, certainly. There are cultural differences, certainly. But those do not detract from the fact that slavery is the driving force that leads America to the Civil War. And I will, well, I'll, I'll get to it now and I'll, I'll get to it again when I wrap up here. Why does this matter? I'll return to the question 
in a few minutes, but for now I'll say the cumulative effect of these misconceptions about slavery is to treat slavery as no big deal, as simply a cultural difference, as a, a minor wound, if it is a wound at all, that would have just healed on its own if left to itself. But that badly misunderstands the context that Frederick Douglass was writing in, what he was writing against, and why he felt he had to write. To understand 19th century American literature, you have to understand that slavery was the biggest and most pressing political issue of the day. It was not a minor sideshow to other larger problems. So in order to make this argument that the Civil War was in fact about slavery, uh, I have four categories of evidence that I want to put in front of you. Pro-secession pamphlets, secession documents of the southern states, the Constitution of the Confederate States, and the cornerstone speech made in support of that Constitution. So I'm going to make my case to you that the slavery, uh, excuse me, the Civil War was in fact about slavery, and uh, and then I'll wrap up with telling you, with uh, explaining what this has to do with Frederick Douglass's book. Okay, so four categories of evidence that I'm going to step through. First, pro-secession pamphlets. These are pamphlets, articles, and speeches that were published all across the South in 1860 and 1861, arguing that the Southern states should secede, that is, should leave the United States government. Well, why those dates in particular? Why 1860 and 1861? Why is it that states began to secede at the end of 1860 and into the... Um, early months of 1861, and it is because in eight, November of 1860, um, the anti-slavery Republican Party had just won across the board. Abraham Lincoln was elected president, and the Republican Party gained control in both the House and the Senate. Now again, although Lincoln is not an abolitionist by our earlier definition, he had advocated for gradual emancipation of the slaves, and he had declared in one of his most famous campaign speeches called the House Divided Speech, quote, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. The slave states realized that they had lost the power to protect slavery. They used to be the majority in Congress. Uh, they had used their power, in fact, to enforce a gag rule in Congress, saying no one is allowed to speak against slavery on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And for eight years, they held that rule in effect, from 1836 to 1844. And that's just the timing. The reasons that these pamphlets give arguing we need to leave the Union are even clearer. So here's one, The Doom of Slavery in the Union, Its Safety Out of It, by John Townsend of South Carolina, published in October of 1860. And he begins, this is the, he goes right into it. Gentlemen of the Association, as we are organized for the object especially, especially of protecting our slave institutions, it is proper that we should hold frequent counsel together, etc. He says that right out of the bat, this is why we're organizing. Here's another, The Philosophy of Secession, A Southern View, published by a South Carolinian in February of 1861. And he says, the South is now in the formation of a slave republic. The contest is not between the North and the South as geographical sections, for between such sections merely there can be no contest. Notice what Spratt's doing here is he's saying, listen, it's not just that we have regional differences, economic differences, cultural differences. That's not really the contest by which means conflict. But the real contest, he says, is between the two forms of society which have become established, the one in the North and the other in the South. What does he mean by the two forms of society? The one is a society composed of one race, the other, the South, of two races. The one is bound together but by the two great social relations of husband and wife and parent and child the other, the South, by the three relations, husband and wife, parent and child, and master and slave. The one, that is the North, embodies in its political structure, structure the principle that equality is the right of man. The other, that equality is the right of equals only. And here's one I'll spend a little more time on because it is written by a man from Lynchburg, our own fair city. His name is William Holcomb and it was published in February of 1861. 
A sectional party, inimical, that means uh, enemies, to our institutions. And when Southerners talk about our institutions or our peculiar institution, they mean slavery. And odious to our people is about taking possession of the federal government. The seed sown by the early abolitionists has yielded a luxurious harvest. When Lincoln is in place, Garrison, uh, William Lloyd Garrison was a leading abolitionist of the day, will be in power. Notice his fear about abolition there. And then much like Spratt, Holcomb says, it's not other things, guys, it's slavery. He has not analyzed this subject aright. Who supposes that the real quarrel between the North and the South is about the territories or the decision of the Supreme Court or even the Constitution itself? The division is broader and deeper and more incurable than this. The antagonism is fundamental and ineradicable. It means it can't be erased or gotten rid of. The true secret of it, of the conflict, lies in the total reversion of public opinion, which has occurred in both sections of the country in the last quarter of a century on the subject of slavery. The true secret of it is slavery, he says. The Northern mind has become so thoroughly anti-slavery in sentiment. Even those who contend for our constitutional rights share in the universal opinion that slavery is a great moral and social evil. Those who have adopted the pro-slavery view are exceedingly few in numbers up in the North, he means, and are regarded by the mass of Northern people as more fanatical than the most extreme abolitionists. To the uh, pro-slavery defenders in the South, the abolitionists were dangerous radicals and fanatics. The press, the pulpit, the rostrum of the North are clamorous with declamation against us and our institutions. Slavery is considered not only immoral, but debasing to both owner and owned. It is, they say, a relic of barbarism and a disgrace to an enlightened people. Notice the, hear the hurt, in it, if you will, in his tone here, right? Uh, they morally disapprove. Our, our um, opinions on this subject have diverged too much. And here is Holcomb's response to that moral disapproval. Man has no inalienable rights, he says, not even those of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If the life he leads, the liberty he enjoys, and the happiness he pursues are not consistent with the order and well-being of society, he may righteously be deprived of them all. That government is the best and its people the happiest, not in which all are free and equal, but in which equal races are free, by which he means white people, and the inferior race, by which he means black people, is wisely and humanely subordinated, that is put under um, control. The second category of evidence here. The secession documents of the states which left the Union. Of the 11 Confederate states that left the Union uh, and formed the Confederate States of America, uh, four of them wrote uh, detailed documents called uh, Declaration of the Causes which Induce and Justify Secession. Um, the others passed just much briefer resolutions saying, we're leaving. But four states said, we're leaving and here's why. In those four documents, all four say they are leaving because of slavery. They're very clear. Now, there are other issues that they raise too, certainly. But slavery is central in all four documents. And I want to show you some of that. Here's Mississippi's, um, January of 1861. And this is the beginning of their resolution, the opening lines. In the momentous step which our state has taken of dissolving its connection with the government of which we so long formed a part, it is but just that we should declare the prominent reasons which have induced our course. Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. Right there in the opening of their secession document. Think of this as their version of the Declaration of Independence, which had a very similar purpose, right? To declare to Great Britain and to the world at large the reasons that the United States have for wanting to dissolve that political union. Well, here you have Mississippi saying, here are reasons for wanting to dissolve our political union with the United States government. Reason number one, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. Here is Georgia's um, secession document. The people of Georgia, having dissolved their political connection with the government of the United States of America, present to their Confederates and the world the causes which have led to the separation. For the last 10 years, we've had numerous and serious causes of complaint against our non-slaveholding Confederate states with reference to the subject of African slavery. Again, it's opening lines right out of the gate. We're leaving over slavery. South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union. They did so in December of 1860. 
uh, and I'll spend a little more time uh, in theirs for that reason. <clears throat> An increasing hostility. Now, South Carolina opens with a long preamble and does not, as these other two do, just come right out of the gate and say, hey, it's slavery. Uh, they, they start with a, um, a neuradio of sorts, with sort of the, the history of the United States government up to that point and uh, the creation of the Constitution and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and then they get to this part. An increasing hostility on the part of the non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery has led to a disregard of their obligations. Uh, specifically, they mean, and these are my words, not theirs here in the brackets, specifically uh, to recapture and return men and women who escaped slavery. And that's uh, in the lines just before it and the lines just after it. I, I will show you that to see where, to show you where I got that from. Uh, these states, now continuing in their words again, have enacted laws which either nullify the acts of Congress or render useless any attempt to execute them. A geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to the high office of President of the United States, whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. Notice the reacting there to the election of Lincoln. Why? Because his opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. He said that the nation cannot remain half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. Continuing, he is to be entrusted with the administration of the common government because he has declared that that government cannot endure permanently half slave, half free, and that the public mind must rest in the belief that slavery is in the course of ultimate extinction. And if slavery is going to be out, says George, South Carolina, well, then we are out. And they further complain about the behavior of the northern states. Those states have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety, that is like the moral rightness, of our domestic institutions. Again, that means slavery. And have denied the rights of property. And that means the property in man, uh, the, the uh, supposed right to hold slaves, established in 15 of the states. They have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. They have permitted open establishment among them of societies whose avowed object is to align the property of the citizens of other states. Align means remove. They have encouraged and assisted thousands of our slaves to leave their homes. Let me go back to this real quickly here, back up just a little bit. First one in South Carolina, yes. Now, I, I spend a little more time with South Carolina in particular because I want you to see in South Carolina's secession document, what they are complaining about is not that the federal government has too much say over what the states do. In fact, they are specifically complaining that the states, the northern states, are nullifying the acts of Congress. That is, are not listening to the federal government. I think this is powerful evidence against the claim that the Civil War was really about states' rights, that some states said the federal government shouldn't tell everyone what to do, the states should decide what to do. Well, no, South Carolina's entire complaint is that these northern states are not enforcing the fugitive slave laws that, uh, the, that Congress has passed. That is, they are not capturing black men and women who've run away from slavery and shipping them back down south. And we want them to do that. Maine, Massachusetts, you don't get to say whether you will listen to the federal government or not, says South Carolina. You have to return uh, escaped slaves. My third category of evidence is the Constitution of the Confederate States. I asked a friend of mine who uh, is a professor of history and taught for some time at Liberty, taught history for some time at Liberty, what he thought of the causes of the Civil War. It's a topic of interest to me. And uh, he told me, if you want to know what people fought for, look at the government they created. All right, if you want to know why uh, the United States uh, broke with King George and formed uh, their own nation, look at the government they created. What is it that they were after? And so I did. And if you look at the Constitution of the Confederate States, you will find that it looks much like the Constitution of the United States. Uh, but note what it adds. Here's Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4. No bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. The Constitution of the Confederate States, the, the, the structure of the government is much like the United States Constitution. They pretty much just copied and pasted for large sections of that thing, but they made sure to add in no law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. <clears throat> 
Here's another section. The Confederate States may acquire new territory. In all such territories, the institution of Negro slavery, as it now exists in the Confederate States, shall be recognized and protected by Congress and by the territorial government. Notice that what the, the Constitution of the Confederate States is saying here is that new states that might join the Confederate States in the future do not get to decide whether slavery will be legal there or not. Again, it's not a states' rights issue. They're saying any new territories acquired by the Confederate States will be slave territories and will be slave states. So again, if you want to see what a, what a people fought for, look at the government that they created. The government that they created was, um, in the words of, um, oh, not Holcomb, not Spratt, our first gentleman, I've lost his name, a slave republic, Townsend, a slave republic. Okay, and finally, my fourth category of evidence for this is the cornerstone speech given by Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy. Um, and he gave this speech uh, to the Confederate, the uh, assembly that um, voted in the Confederate Constitution in Savannah, Georgia, I gave it in March of 1861. Now, this is the vice president of the Confederacy speaking on the occasion of having just ratified that new Confederate Constitution that protected uh, slavery perpetually. In its text, right? And so what does the Vice President of the Confederacy have to say about the government that they have just created? In this speech he says, the new Constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution. There's that phrase again, African slavery as it exists among us, the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. This was the immediate cause, African slavery, of the late rupture and the present revolution. Jefferson, and Stevens is going back to the beginning, to the founding of the United States, Thomas Jefferson he's speaking of, in his forecast had anticipated that this slavery was the rock upon which the old union would split. He's quoting from Jefferson there, who had wanted to uh, write against slavery in the Constitution, and um, that just... This a, another and a larger discussion that did not happen. But Jefferson had said, this is the rock upon which the Union will split. Uh, Stevens says he was right. What was conjecture with him is now a realized fact. But whether he fully comprehended the great truth upon which that rock stood and stands may be doubted. So in other words, Jefferson was right that we would break over, over this, but he was wrong to think slavery was wrong. That's what Stevens is saying here. The prevailing ideas entertained by him and most of the leading statesmen at the time of the formation of that old constitution were that the enslavement of the African was in violation of the laws of nature. That's what Jefferson and, and many of the founders against slavery but unwilling to put that into effect believed, Stevens is saying, that the enslavement of the African was in violation of the laws of nature, that it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. It was an evil they knew not well how to deal with. But the general opinion of the men of that day was that somehow or other, in the order of providence, the institution would be evanescent, that means temporary, and would pass away. This idea, though not incorporated in the Constitution, was the prevailing idea at that time. Those ideas, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. This was an error. It was a sandy foundation, and the government built upon it fell when the storm came and the wind blew. You see what Stevens is saying? Jefferson understood that this slavery issue would break the Union. He was right about that, but he was wrong to think that slavery was wrong. Because, Stevens says, the races are not equal, and ours is a government established with that in mind, that the races are not equal. Here's how he concludes. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. And this was an applause line. This was a speech given orally, and uh, we have copies of it because people in the audience were writing it down. And they noted this was the applause line. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth.
All right, so conclusions from this section and application of those to Douglas and his book. My argument here is that the Civil War was fundamentally about slavery. The Southern states seceded in order to create, quote, a slave republic, a government in which slavery would be perpetual, a government that um, saw, um, saw the natural order of things, saw as being uh, white people are naturally created for mastery and black people are naturally created for slavery and servitude. And they said, this is the right and natural order of things. Uh, and so our government built upon this right and natural order will be a stronger government for that reason. So why does this matter to Douglas? We need to understand that gradual emancipation of slavery was nowhere on the horizon in the middle of the 19th century. Frederick Douglass and other black abolitionists were literally writing for their lives and for the lives of four million black Americans held in bondage at the time. As I said earlier, we have to understand the place of slavery in American society in order to understand why Douglass wrote and what he hoped to accomplish. In his narrative, he recounts not only his personal experience, but he systematically dismantles the common pro-slavery arguments of his own day. Look for that as you read. And beyond understanding the literature we're reading, this topic can give us some understanding of issues that are important in our own time. It should inform our debates about Confederate symbols, which is very much a, a current debate right now. It's flag, the Confederate flag and statues. And I know people who fly the Confederate flag usually intend it as a symbol that their country boys are proud of it or that they're rebels, either uh, against authority generally or against Washington, D.C. in particular. But we should not forget what that flag meant to the people who originally ran it up the pole. In their own words, it was the symbol of a slave republic founded on the idea that the natural order demanded white people should be masters and black people should be slaves. That historical understanding allows us to see how and why modern white supremacists would use Confederate symbols in their iconography. And it should allow us to understand why people object to those symbols. But returning to uh, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was one of several key abolitionists in the middle of the 19th century. I'm just giving you context here. Um, and I guess I want to make one point about all four of these figures. The two that I'll focus on, I've, I've mentioned William Lloyd Garrison here. He was mentioned in um, uh, one of the speeches or pamphlets earlier. Um, Will, William Wilberforce was a British member of parliament who, after his conversion to evangelical Christianity, worked to abolish the slave trade in Britain back in 1833. William Lloyd Garrison was a devout Presbyterian, Sojourner Truth, was an American born into slavery in New York. Uh, remember, and I will return to this later, I promise uh, that slavery and racism is a problem for the entire United States. It is not only uh, a problem for the Southern states. Um, and when we get to the Harlem Renaissance, we will talk about Northern racism. Um, but uh, Sojourner Truth was born into slavery in New York. Uh, she escaped and she had a conversion experience in the Methodist church. And so she traveled the North preaching against slavery. Her most famous address is Ain't I a Woman? And then, of course, Frederick Douglass, who we're talking about and we'll read more about now. But the thread that I want to point out through, through this here, all four of these people saw their abolitionism as a Christian duty. For Wilberforce and Sojourner Truth, in fact, it, it came immediately after, immediately after some kind of conversion experience, right? Um, We'll talk more and we'll read more about the relationship between Douglass's Christian faith and his abolitionism. In part, there's a lot that could be said about this, um, but just to connect it to one of the themes of our course, I think this too is part of the legacy of Puritanism in American culture. Uh, these four people have the view that your Christian faith make demand, makes demands upon the kind of society that you build going to claim to be a Christian. There are certain ways that you should organize society and certain ways that you should not. All right, so let's, let me talk a little bit then about Frederick Douglass, his life and his work. Douglass was born in slavery, uh, born into slavery in Maryland uh, under the name Frederick Bailey. 
His mother was an enslaved woman, and Douglas recounts in his autobiography how early in his life he was separated from her. Uh, he believes this was a practice um, intentionally done to um, weaken the natural bonds uh, in families and make um, black slaves easier to move around and to sell off and, and that sort of thing. But um, he was separated from her very young, uh, like two or three years old, if I remember correctly, um, <clears throat> and only knows about his father for sure, that his father was a white man. Uh, Douglas tells us about this in his narrative also, that uh, he assumes his father was his master because that's what everyone around him says, but he has no confirmation of that. As a boy, Douglas learned to read, and uh, once he had mastered that, as a, as a young man, taught other slaves to read as well, even though uh, he was beaten if he was caught. Um, education was enormously important to Frederick Douglass. He realized its power. Uh, and I'll get to that more in just a minute. But there's this great quote of his that I, I have up on the screen here for you. Without education, man lives within the narrow, dark, and grimy walls of ignorance. Education, on the other hand, means emancipation. It means light and liberty. It means the uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, the light by which men can only be made free. Notice the importance of education to Douglas, the uplifting of the soul of man. That's what you're doing when you're getting an education, not just learning how to read and, and write persuasive memos for your job. Those are, it's important to have a good job, of course, but uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, that's a much higher calling. That's a calling worth risking a beating for. And Douglas did that for himself and for other people as well. So um, one of the early texts that he got his hands on uh, speaks to the power of a classical education. It was a book called The Columbian Orator, which was a collection of, of great and famous speeches in the Western tradition from Roman times to modern times. And reading those speeches, Douglas uh, talks about uh, the way those speeches gave him just this um, a yearning for freedom. Um, that kind of education is called a liberal education. Liberal in the sense of it makes you free. Liber, free, the Latin word is free. Not in the sense of modern left-right politics, but liberal in the sense that it makes you free, right? It, it elevates the soul up towards freedom. And that's what the, the noble sentiments expressed in those speeches, that's what Douglas found. It gave him a yearning for freedom. Uh, we'll read some of his uh, stories as a young man from uh, in excerpts from his narrative, but he does manage to escape in his mid-twenties with the help of his fiancée, Anna Murray, who is a free black woman. And so he escapes um, with her help, marries her 11 days after getting free, um, and the two of them settle in New Bedford, Massachusetts, interestingly enough because that shows up, that's the second time it shows up in our course. Of course, uh, New Bedford is where Ishmael stops on his way to Nantucket. It was a whaling town, uh, but New Bedford was also um, a, had a strong abolitionist community and a strong free black community. And uh, so uh, Frederick and Anna move there. He's encouraged to speak and write by the community there in New Bedford, and so he begins to do that. He begins to show up to abolitionist meetings and tell his story, and uh, eventually collects it into this book, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, which is published, as I said, in 1845. And I will come back to this picture. He, he published his picture in it for a very important reason that I want to tell you about. I'll come back to that in a minute. Shortly after its publication, he traveled to England. I'll come back to that in a minute, too. It'll all come together, you'll see. He traveled to England uh, for a couple years and returned in 1847 um, with enough money to purchase his freedom. He traveled to England to uh, speak on the lecture circuit there about American slavery and abolition. And he returned uh, with enough money to purchase his freedom. Why would he need to do that? I'll get back to that in just a minute. Um, so, Douglas goes on to become, now that he has, well, maybe I should tell you now and I'll expand upon it in a minute. Remember, the fugitive slave law was uh, still a threat for a man like Douglas who had escaped slavery. And if you publish a book about your experiences and people say, oh, wait a minute, so you're an escaped slave, 
you are all of a sudden worth a lot of money to some unscrupulous people who would be happy to clap you in chains and ship you back south in order to collect the reward money. So having published this book, D Douglas was in some great amount of personal danger that that would happen. So that's why he has to leave for England, and that's why when he comes back, he brings back money in order to purchase his freedom. Then he is legally free and can no longer be uh, captured and or cannot legally anyway be captured and, uh, and sold back south into slavery again. So he becomes an early black public intellectual. Well, what do I mean by that? I've, I've used this phrase before. Remember, a public intellectual is uh, a person whose expertise in some area and their speaking ability is called upon to talk to the American public or any public, but we're an American lit. So talk to the American public. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, they're public intellectuals that we have talked about. And uh, Frederick Douglass was too. He was called upon to give all sorts of speeches, to engage in debates with pro-slavery speakers. In fact, he did that so much that some of his more radical abolitionist friends got uh, upset at him. And they said um, uh, there was this kind of no union with slaveholders attitude in some of the more radical segments of the abolitionist movement that said if people want to leave over slavery, fine, let them leave. I don't want to let them be in the same government as me anyway, right? And we shouldn't debate them. We shouldn't have their ideas put out there on the public stage, even if you're going to argue against them. We don't want to hear what they have to say. And uh, Douglas responded, I'll read a quote from him. First, he says, the Constitution is, according to its reading, an anti-slavery document. And second, to dissolve the Union as a means to abolish slavery is about as wise as it would be to burn up this city in order to get the thieves out of it. But again, we hear the Union, uh, sorry, the motto, no union with slaveholders. And I answer it with a more sensible motto, namely, no union with slaveholding. I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong. It's a great line, one of the things that made Douglas such, a, in addition to a rich uh, speaking voice, um, those, uh, the ability to come up with those great memorable lines, I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong. So he continued to debate uh, pro-slavery speakers, um, even got to the point where he advised Abraham Lincoln. Um, he had his own um, disagreements with Lincoln, in fact. Frederick Douglass was uh, advising him to make the emancipation of slaves a more central priority in the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln's priority was just to keep the Union together first and foremost, right? And Douglass said, you need to make the emancipation of slaves a higher priority. And he said, you need to arm black Americans and let them fight for their freedom. And Lincoln was hesitant to do this at first and eventually was convinced by Douglass. He also advised President Andrew Johnson, who was uh, sabotaging the Reconstruction effort in the South. Douglas was telling him, stop doing that, and that didn't go so well. Um, he's also called upon to write or speak to the American public on public occasions, including a very famous uh, Fourth of July speech that he gave called, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? He gave that in 1852, so about 10 years before the Civil War, and uh, while slavery was still um, legal in the southern states, still practice in the southern states? That's a good question if you've not thought about it before. They come to Frederick Douglass and say, it's the 4th of July. Would you get, when you're a noted public intellectual, Frederick Douglass, would you give us a speech? And so he has to think, well, what should the 4th of July mean to the slave? A good question. And another famous speech he gave was uh, in 1876 at the dedication of the Emancipation Memorial that honored Abraham Lincoln. So that sort of thing, speeches and debates and, uh, and advising presidents. Um, he published the North Star, an abolitionist paper, and uh, was committed in his life not only to abolitionism, but to women's suffrage, that is, uh, the right of women to vote. And he said about this, in this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of woman and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government of the world. Slavery should be ended, women should be able to vote, were the two great social issues that Douglas devoted his life to. Let me return now to why Douglas um, 
has his picture on the inside front cover of his book, The Narrative. Douglas showed remarkable courage in publishing the book under his own name, not a uh, pretended name, and full of details. So it was the convention in slave narratives in order to protect the, the safety of the escaped slave to um, not give the names of people or places that would allow someone to identify you for sure. So I might give my own name, but I might say something like, um, I'm Mr. Forshee and I work at the N-C-S- instead of New Covenant Schools for a Mr. S-M instead of Scott McCurley and J-H instead of John Eaton. So by disguising some of these details behind um, abbreviations, I give myself enough plausible deniability that I can say, oh no, that's you're accusing me of being an escaped slave? No, no, that's you've totally misunderstood. I, that's not the place that I'm from. Those aren't the people that I know. And Douglas didn't do that. He gave the details, and here's why. A couple years before he published his narrative, there was a well-meaning but foolish white abolitionist of the North who published um, a fake slave narrative. Now, I told you that slave narratives were the predominant genre of African-American writing in the 19th century. There were a lot of them telling the stories of the horrors encounter, encountered under slavery. And so, of course, there are people in the South saying, oh, psh, this is all it's made up or exaggerated and that kind of thing. Well, along comes this uh, particular um, abolitionist who says, I really want to help the cause. And so I'm going to write this real, this real heart wrencher of a book and uh, it, I'll just turn people's opinion against slavery all the more powerfully. Uh, that was stupid because that allowed uh, the detractors from this form of writing, the Southerners who said it's all made up, they could point in that book and say, listen, we can prove this one's made up. And in fact, they could because it was. So Douglas is publishing his true narrative shortly after that one. He wants to be believed. He needs to be believed because ending slavery in America is the great cause that he's devoted himself to, right? How can he be sure that he is believed? He puts his picture in the front of the book. This is me right here, he says. And he fills the book with details, not only place name and people name details, but he says, you can go to this town and ask these people if what I'm saying is true. In fact, um, this works out to his advantage because um, his former master, Thomas Auld, reads this book and writes into the newspaper to say, um, Frederick Douglass has, has grossly abused me in this book. I, I didn't beat him like that at all. I don't know what he's talking about. And uh, Douglass responded to the newspaper and said, first of all, um, thanks for confirming that, quote, I am what I proclaim myself to be. Right? Thanks for confirming that I am actually Frederick Douglass, the escaped slave of, uh, that formerly lived on your plantation. Right? And as to whether you beat me or not, he says, quote, my memory in such matters is better than yours. So he showed remarkable courage in publishing this book, not anonymously, in order to get his point across. As I said once before in this lecture, I'd like you to look out for this as you read. Douglas systematically dismantles pro-slavery arguments uh, throughout his narrative. And um, one thing that we will also turn our attention to in our um, the questions I ask you to write in, in our discussion is the distinction Douglas draws, Douglas a committed Christian, uh, between Christianity and what he calls slaveholding religion. All right, I'll send around the reading and some questions for you to keep in mind as you read and annotate. Uh, Douglas is um, a personal hero of mine and uh, a man of great, of, as I said a couple times now, uh, remarkable courage and uh, this powerful ability. So I hope that you enjoy that as you read it. Take care, everybody. I'll see you soon.